I'm absolutely delighted to introduce this panel, uh, and I'm actually going to let the moderator, Seamus Murphy, uh, fill you in on most of the detail, but I've had the distinct pleasure of working with most people on this panel in, um, uh, over the last many, many years. I won't say how many, um, but we are absolutely delighted. This, uh, Seamus is going to lead the panel through a conversation about pharmaceutical coverage and access to pharmaceutical coverage in Canada as part of this broader conversation about health innovation and, and prosperity as a result of health innovation. Seamus, uh, long-standing career in the political environment, former, former uh, Director of Communications for Deb Matthews in her various roles, ministerial roles in Ontario, and uh, now leading Council of Public Affairs practice in Ottawa, is going to moderate a discussion involving, I'm gonna start at the end, Patty Mead, former Deputy Minister of Health, for the province of Alberta. Sitting beside Patty is Louise Binder from the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Beside uh, Louise is Perry Eisenschmidt, CEO of the Canadian Pharmacists Association. And then we have Glenn Monteith from Innovative Medicines Canada. I'm sure it will be a fantastic discussion. Over to you, Seamus. Thanks so much, Shannon, and it's, it's great to be here. So we're here, to we're here today to talk about innovation in healthcare, and in particular, disruption to a healthcare system in dire need of renewal. So here's the good news. Innovation in prescription drugs means that new medications have helped Canadians to live longer, fuller lives. And today on World AIDS Day, there's no better example than the advances that we've seen with respect to that condition. But these medications come at a significant cost, both at the front end through investments in R&D and to Canadians, largely through a mix of public and private drug plans. With a growing and aging population, we know that the pressure is greater than ever to bend the healthcare cost curve towards sustainability. There has been some progress on this front. Uh, we need to give ourselves some credit for that. Ontario, for instance, has wrestled 7 to 8% annual health budget increases down to a more manageable 2 to 3% rate of increase. But when it comes to drugs, which account for less than one-tenth of total health system costs, in recent years, Canada has seen the highest rate of drug price increases among comparator countries. So, is reforming Canada's system of pharmaceutical coverage the toughest challenge in achieving healthcare system sustainability? We've assembled a tremendous panel representing many of the viewpoints in the drug system to find out. Uh, Louise Binder with the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network brings over 20 years of experience advocating for patients in health policy development. Representing Canada's medication experts, we're joined by Perry Eisenschmidt, CEO of the Canadian Pharmacists Association. Patty Mead is former Deputy Minister of Health in Alberta, Yukon, and Northwest Territories, and has direct experience running several health authorities in Western Canada. And Glenn Monteith is Vice President of Innovation and Health Sustainability for Innovative Medicines Canada, the voice of Canada's brand pharmaceutical industry. He's also a former drug plan manager from the province of Alberta. We have a lot of ground to cover and we hope to leave enough time for some questions from the floor, so let's dive into it. I wanna break this issue down a bit uh, to start. Uh, so, uh, Health Minister Jane Philpott gave a major speech at the last Canada 2020 Health Conference in September, and she raised a lot of interesting points about her ideas for health system reform when it comes to drugs. Perry, let's start with you. Minister Philpott said that many of the new drug therapies approved each year come, um, offer little benefit over what is currently available, yet come at a significant extra cost. So those are strong words. Do you think Health Canada should take into account what medications are already on the market when approving new drugs? And would this limit dispensing options for Canadians? Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm always amazed in this, uh, the context of um, pharmaceuticals and, and medicine, um, the things that we think are reasonable questions. If, if we were talking about um, child car seats and, and regulating those and making sure that only uh, safe and, and effective car seats were launched on the market, I don't think anybody, if I were to ask you, you know, is it the government's um, uh, role to de um, determine first if there are comparable car seats available before making that evaluation, you'd look at me like I had... Uh, two heads. So um, I, I, I can't believe you know, these, these are even considered uh, uh, reasonable questions. But uh, having asked the question, I think it's very clear. Health Canada has a very specific mandate is to make sure that there are safe and effective medications uh, launched in the uh, Canadian market. Uh, that is what their core competency is. 
uh, they don't have a competency in, in looking at uh, relative cost effectiveness versus uh, other, other medications. But more importantly, I, I don't think um, that's a gap that needs to be filled in the marketplace right now. If anything, we have too many agencies and departments that are looking at cost effectiveness. Uh, INIS, CADETH, PMPRB, um, uh, Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. There's lots of people looking at cost effectiveness. The last thing we need is yet uh, one other agency um, getting in, into that space. What we do need, I think, is, is a, a deliberate plan and a more cohesive approach to um, having specialized roles. You know, who's looking at health and safety of uh, patients? Who's looking at cost effectiveness? Cost, and effect, cost effectiveness is a very important thing that needs to be looked at, but let's have, you know, one group specializing in that rather than having multiple uh, groups looking at that. All right. So I found it interesting that Minister Philpott also um, uh, had her sights set on the private drug plan market. Uh, she said that private drug plans list new drugs before their cost effectiveness has been reviewed, and furthermore, that private insurers should take part in joint price negotiations with the provinces. So Louise, um, to you, many of your members would be on private drug plans. Do you think that the private system, with its emphasis on patient choice, would benefit from greater coordination with provincial plans? Uh, thank you for that. On. Thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I don't think that private insurers care about patient choice at all. Um, I think they care about making scads of money and uh, delivering as little as they can get away with while they're doing it. So, and they're proving that to us now every day with the, the retrenchment uh, by a lot of the private insurers in what they're willing to provide. So I, I always thought that private insurance was something that you got to give you something more than what you already had in the public system. If it isn't, let's just stop having private insurers and let's just put all the money into the public system and we'll just forget about it. But if they're going to continue to say that they're providing something to employers to make them have the opportunity to attract and retain people as part of a compensation package, or they're going to allow me as an individual to purchase something more than what I can get in the public system, um, then they, then they do have to believe in patient choice and they do have to pay for stuff. And in fact, they're going in absolutely the opposite direction. I recently met with one of the ministers of health in a province not so close to here on the West, and I said to him, don't fall into that private insurer trap. And he said, you know, I find it very interesting. Private industry, when they're doing really well and they think governments aren't doing so well, say, you should give us everything to do because we in private industry really know how to do stuff and you governments don't. And the minute they run into a little bump in the road, then suddenly it's, you governments need to help us out because we in private industry are, are like poor little private industry. So, you know, you can't have it always. And uh, no, the, an the short answer to, the law to that question is, no, I don't think they should be at the PCPA table because it's a completely different purpose for which we have private and, and public insurance. If they want to do that, get out of the field, give us all the money in the public system, and we'll sort it out. Okay. Well, uh, Glenn, the minister also sing singled out how we uh, price patented medications, saying in essence that Canada shouldn't be compared to more R&D intensive markets like the United States and Germany. Uh, do you think that Canadian pharmaceutical companies, first off, get enough credit for the R&D that they do in Canada, and should our system give patients who run out of options uh, more access to clinical trials? Uh, thank you. This is on. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you for the question, and I, I want to correct a piece of information at the very beginning of this session. So, Canada does not have the second highest drug costs in the, in the world. In the OECD data, this is, this is a misconception, in the OECD data it has the second highest expenditures per capita in the OECD, which is price of drugs, but it's also the volume of medications that are used, a very different measure. Uh, when it goes to actually the pricing uh, in the latest uh, Patent Medicine Prices Review Board annual report, depending on how what technical measure you want to use, we're third or fourth in the comparator countries, who are the R&D countries that are in that basket. So absolutely, uh, we should be uh, considered uh, in, the, uh, in the innovation basket, um, uh, like Germany, like the United States, as well as the other members. In fact, both the federal government and the uh, provincial governments are all driving innovation agendas right now. Okay, I think the confusion is the measure that the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board uses to measure the innovation investment in Canada is a 30-year-old outmoded 
tool for how innovation is actually funded. A lot of the funding for innovation in this country is not the bricks and mortar where you set up your own in-house research. It's now funding things through research institutes, academic centers, startup companies, etc. So a lot of it's through venture capital funding, a lot of it's through funding related to mergers and acquisitions, a lot of it is in fact, quite, quite honestly, uh, dealing with um, uh, clinical trials investments for which if the, fu if the funds for it are outside of Canada, coming into Canada, that uh, even if it's from the same company who's operating in Canada, it doesn't get counted. So I think what we need to do is reshape the conversation around um, the innovation agenda, uh, the very important role that, uh, that Canadian companies and the, and the uh, Canadian uh, um, um, affiliates of international companies can bring to the innovation agenda and really establish um, from a life sciences and particularly with a human health focus, um, the beachhead for a modern, uh, highly innovative uh, post-industrial economy. And I think there's a huge opportunity there. Uh, now, turning to Patty. So, uh, Minister Philpott um, concluded uh, her remarks by stating that her goal is a common national drug formulary for publicly funded plans. So, Patty, what are the challenges that you see with moving to a common national formulary? Would this require rolling back coverage in some parts of the country? Would it pose a challenge to the approval of new medications, or could it result in efficiencies in greater coverage? Well, thanks for the soft question. <laughs> I'm going uh, to be um, I'm going to be honest. Therefore. Um, probably offend a few people. Um, my first question is, why are we even talking about a national formulary and talking about a national formulary in isolation of the whole drug piece? And that's the continued pattern that we've had since we didn't include pharma in Medicare. Um, and we still keep going at the same language and the same problem. So my question to the federal minister would be, how did you suddenly start talking about a national formulary? You weren't there when we talked about a pharmacare program several years ago uh, when the provinces and territories with the federal government tried to talk at least about catastrophic national approach and national funding and formulary. Um, and so it's not really a slight on the federal government, but I do find it surprising because it was actually the PTs who had to get together through the premiers to even start to look at some commonality around drugs. Um, so the first challenge is, in the current to the future state, and more importantly the future state, is looking at a common formulary actually a solution when we haven't really defined what the true problem is or where it goes to. So that, that's my first point, is that's a challenge. And to, you know, uh, bureaucrats, I'm a reformed one now apparently, um, that, that you, you actually come in with white noise if you're talking about stuff that isn't clearly defined. And that just allows us to continue in Canada to not get to the real uh, solution and outcomes. The other issue is I do think there's a great risk if you do look at common formularies. And I'm going to open it up to being both private and public. I don't think we should be limiting here if we're talking about a formulary. Um, I think there's a great risk. It was said earlier about risk avoidance in, in the healthcare system. Anything that has a huge political and public funding component is also risk avoidance. So the, I think there's a fear, a risk to introduction of new medications would at least be slower uh, when you're looking at a, a, a common uh, system. Um, I also think there would be, truly would be uh, losers. Um, there are good systems in Canada, uh, there are more expensive, there are more restrictive, but at some point, and having lived north of 60, and we always forget there's territories, but I'm going to include PEI, some of the other um, provinces, you know, you will go by budget and size alone to a much lower threshold. So, um, first of all, why? Is that the solution? Have we really landed that that's the solution? And two, if that is the solution, we have huge barriers around language, what's included, and I do think a great risk to both patient access is going to be slowed down. Um, uh, the impact on R&D, well, we're trying to talk already about increased innovation and economy and making Canada a go-to nation for this. We have to balance that tension between growing and limiting, and they're two different budgets. Thanks. Okay. 
Thanks very much. Well, let's let's veer uh, in the direction of some of those recent uh, conversations that have been happening at, at the provincial and territorial letter, uh, level, um, starting with this fact, one in 10 Canadians do not take their medications as prescribed because of the cost. These are the uninsured or underinsured. And underuse of medications uh, costs the system, uh, by some predictions, up to $9 billion annually. At the same time, 9 in 10 Canadians uh, say that they support some form of universal access to necessary medications. Now, with the health accord talks underway, um, the issue of pharmacare has, has really gone on the back burner. So, Perry, I want to ask you, why is agreement on national pharmacare so elusive? Is it accurate to say that there's tension between those who want to drive down the cost of medications and increase access to coverage, and those who want to have access to the very best medicines in the world? I don't, I don't think that's the contributor to uh, delays in, in getting traction on national pharmacare. I think uh, Patty actually described it better. I think there's a, a general risk aversion, and I think uh, people uh, legitimately see national pharmacare as potentially adding uh, short-term costs to a system that's already very, uh, very constrained. So I think that's what's led to the delay. Um, I think legitimately, though, that tension that you're talking about um, will and is starting to play out uh, as we look towards potential models for pharmacare. So I think the window for pharmacare has opened up, um, unfortunately, from a negative perspective, which is how do we continue to uh, look for opportunities to reduce the, uh, the overall cost spend budget uh, for the various governments and looking at kind of national bulk purchasing, pharmacare is a national bulk purchasing uh, kind of uh, catalyst. Um, but I, I think it will be important to shift that conversation as we, if we legit, legitimately want to look at national pharmacare to uh, you know, different uh, approaches to that. Um, I think anybody who stands back and, and looks at, you know, we, we've heard the, the, the figure less than 15% of total healthcare spending is in the, in the pharma space or the medication space. You can continue to chip away that 15%, but if, if the other 85% continues to grow at a pace of 3 or 6%, that's not a sustainable model. And I think where we want to shift the conversation on, on national pharmacare and on the drug plan budget is um, treating that as an investment, looking at where these you know, powerful new medications that, that are having uh, you know, very um, important patient impacts have um, um, very much uh, potential savings el elsewhere in the, in the health system, looking at making investments in there rather than cost containment in that 15% spend, and then trying to find where the cost uh, offsets are elsewhere in the system. I think that's the way to actually end up with a sustainable healthcare system in Canada. Uh, and the window was opening, for I think, for the wrong reason, but now that the window is open, I think we should have a, a very uh, uh, kind of legitimate conversation around the options. Perfect. Well, building on that, uh, Louise, in, in recent years, we've seen a number of new um, life-saving treatments for rare diseases come onto market or soon to be on the market, but they're quite costly. Uh, is catastrophic drug coverage a good first step towards pharmacare, or should the focus be on that one in 10 Canadians who don't have adequate coverage? So I think that might be an interesting question if I were Meryl Streep in Sophie's Choice in the 1940s, but I don't think it's a very relevant question for Louise Binder living in two, almost 2017, which I wasn't supposed to, by the way. I'm one of those people who really are happy about World AIDS Day because if it weren't for those drugs, I'd be dead about 20 years ago. So I have a lot of skin in this game. Um, I think the first I have to say that that we have been so badly served, in my opinion, by politicians in terms of the way they're educating us about what we really are entitled to in this country. The Canada Health Act never promised us drugs. It never did. Uh, and people still don't seem to know that, including, apparently, maybe our Minister of Health. Um, so, you know, the reality is it promised us doctors and hospitals, and the only reason we get any drugs out of it is if you happen to get the drugs that the hospital decides it wants to give you. So let's stop believing that we were ever promised universal health care. Um, I mean, I always say we would have been if our founding fathers had been founding mothers, and I get to say that because just Justin Trudeau says that he's a feminist. But the reality is, I'm reminded when I say that, that Monique Bejan was actually one of the people who helped build that. So that kind of makes my argument down, go downhill until you realize that what she tells us is that she'd have been happy to put 
drugs in there, but the provinces wouldn't do it, and I bet they're really sorry they didn't now. So that being said, the fact that you know we've, we're starting from the wrong place, um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to get to the right place. And if we in Canada really do believe, and I think this is a question, do we what you know what are we trying to solve? As Patty says, if we're really trying to solve the the problem of people at least getting a minimum of access to treatments through our public system, then we have to do both, help the one in 10, and we have to ensure that people like me, who needed a drug to stay alive, I suppose it was a rare disease, didn't seem so rare to us at the time, um, you know, can get them. So this is not a Sophie's Choice question. And in a country like Canada, it doesn't need to be. We just need to get together. And this is one of the problems I really think we have. I say these days, process is the new substance, because really that's the truth. We need to all be in the room together. And the more I, I hear governments say, oh, we can't put patients in the same room as the pharmaceutical industry and with doctors, and you'll all get scared, I don't think so. I don't think we're that scared. So bring us together and let's find a solution. And patients need to give some stuff up too, by the way. Like uh, there was this supply demand question in the last one. We're never going to have enough supply and demand to match. So we're all going to have to give up some stuff here. But you know, if you let us build it, process, we'll live with the outcome, substance, et voila. Not that I have a strong opinion about this. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thanks. We're getting fired up here. Okay. Glenn, uh, public drug plans often require patients to first exhaust older alternatives that may result in side effects or may require patients to, for instance, take a pill four times a day rather than once a day, impacting adherence and health outcomes. How do we give patients on public plans access to better medications? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, that information is quite dated. Um, the truth is, um, the vast majority of medications now, when it, when it comes to uh, OD, BID, TID, QID, the, those are various dosing regimens. Most of the drugs now are once or twice a day because of reformulations, even in the generic format. So some of that kind of uh, go through the convenience discussions worked its way out about 10 years ago uh, in that space. But I think to your point, there is a criteria uh, in t uh, that are usually applied in terms of getting access to a newer medication. <clears throat> but, there's, but there's a bigger fundamental issue to that in the public plans, and that is that most public plans, and you can go from British Columbia to Newfoundland and Labrador, um, they look very different, they're designed very different, but almost without exception, they cover the same type of people. You're poor or you're rich and old. Okay, not rich, excuse me, old. And so when you're dealing with that, but to get at it in a different way. So given that the number one area for which drugs get used is in chronic disease, um, if you're primarily focusing on the, the two cohorts of your population that generally have more illness and may have had more illness longer, um, when you bring a new medication in, its benefit may in fact be earlier in disease therapy. But if you're going to have a, a diabetic who's 75 who's been a diabetic for, for 30 years, when the benefit of the drug really could have been felt on the 40-year-old newly diagnosed, you're likely to put it into a third line instead of a second line or a first line, and you're going to go to the other medications forward. So there's some rationale for some of that. It's not necessarily about cost containment. It is somewhere about where the disease progressions are for, for people. But if you take the five largest chronic disease areas, that's about 70% of the expenditure on pharmaceuticals. And so, um, in, whereas in the, in the, um, in the uh, younger population, some of those drugs, in fact, you want to establish uh, their role in therapy much earlier, reduce the progression of the disease. So this is why it's important not just to have a price conversation. Perry touched on this a little bit. You got to have a price and reason for use and role in therapy conversation if you're going to get the best value of medications. And I think that's where a lot of what you referred to on the underutilization or the non-compliance is the, is the clinical term for it going forward. I think if people understand the benefits in the right order, then it's not about um, you're being treated second rate, it's about you should have been treated earlier. And what's fascinating to me as a former uh, uh, Ministry of Health person, and, and I'm sure Patty observed it as well, is the whole cost in the healthcare system 
fundamentally it's chronic disease management, and there's not a healthcare system in Canada that's set up to manage health from a chronic disease perspective. And we'll get there in a second. So, Patty, uh, do you think we can achieve greater access to needed medication by making incremental changes to the structures already in place for approving and funding medications, or like the events that led to the establishment of universal public health care in this country, which Louise referred to, is more radical change needed? Um, part of my excitement when I listen to um, uh, conversations that happened this morning is the, is the explosion um, in a whole different world that's touching health but outside of health. And I think we see the same thing in the, uh, in the pharma area with new drugs and the move to, to the way drugs will be targeting. At the same time, um, I've lived a long time in, in one of the most unique industries um, and if, if you come from a different industry, the first thing people say is, oh my God, you can't get anything done here. Um, it's massive. There are multiple points of um, control and decision making, the least of which are health ministers and deputies, and further down, even at the administrative level in a healthcare um, system. So incremental has to happen, and it is happening, and we're seeing pockets. And we've complained for the last 10 years about the issues of scalability on some of that incremental change. Um, but at the same time, I don't think the health system will be immune from a revolution and mandate or uh, massive change. Now the problem is we've had massive change in the past, and we haven't allowed it to be positive. Uh, it's driven costs. They've been short term. We've um, even from a budget size aside, you know, we kept the costs down for some time in healthcare, and then they went sky high, mainly on provider salaries in hospitals. Um, so what do we what do we really want? And we're talking about incremental and even revolution on the current state. And you know, do we really want what we have right now? I mean, if you live north of 60, I can tell you, you don't get what you get in Toronto. You're lucky if you see a nurse once every now and then. Uh, nothing wrong with nurses, by the way, because up there they're doing a great job and doing it all, but with support. But it's, they're very, very different systems between urban, rural, and remote Canada, and even who gets what in, in drug, drug coverage and follow-up. So the first issue would be, if we're really going to talk about um, uh, pharmacare in general or universal pharmacare or greater and equitable access to drugs, then we really are talking about finally having a conversation about is Medicare as we know it passe and what does the new world look like? And we're really afraid. And it's a political you know, landmine to go there, so it shouldn't be left to politicians. It's not fair for them to have that conversation. The conversation has to happen in other areas. And one of the fears I have in the conversation we've had so far about, you know, who gets what drugs and is it public or private? And I think you said um, earlier that, you know, we, it, it shouldn't all just be about a public system. The public system for drugs were set up, and you know, Glenn knows this, payers of last resort. Payers of last resort. So what are we really building a system on? Do we, do we want a public system or do we want an improved private system and what other models are out there? And Quebec is an example. Europe is an example that would fit within a federation concept. So incremental has to happen. It has to continue. I hope the pace increases. I hope that we get around the scalability issues. But we also are on the verge of whether it's educating Canadians about what really was. You know, Jeffrey Systems' Chronic Conditions, the first half of that book should be mandatory reading for every Canadian, because we don't know where Medicare came from or what's included to be able to build the future. But we have to have the conversation, and people assume we're having the conversation in health, and a health accord will bring it there. We're not having that conversation at all. We're afraid to have that conversation. We had it about 15 years ago, and um, maybe 20, and most of those politicians got really hurt from it, as did other leaders. So it's time to uh, plant the seeds for the revolution. Okay, bring on the revolution. 
All right. Well, I want to round out the panel by following the money. So we know that 5% of patients account for two-thirds of all health care costs. And on the flip side of that coin, five chronic diseases drive about 75% of health costs. So, Perry, do we need to do a better job of taking to, into account health outcome measures and other system savings when making drug pricing decisions? So should we... Uh, should the health system reward specialty drugs that prevent hospitalizations or reduce dependence on other health services? Uh, again, terminology is so important here. So you're talking about rewarding um, those that are providing uh, innovative medicines. I, I don't view it as a reward. And going back to the, the model that I, I spoke about, I think it's just a logical um, business and patient decision to say um, if, if a, a certain investment, let's say $30,000 investment in care for a certain patient, uh, can alleviate uh, emergency room visits or uh, critical surgery, and that saves the system $70,000. It's not a, a matter of rewarding those that are providing the innovative medicines. It's about making the, the intelligent and informed decision to say that is the right thing to do for the patient. That's the right thing to do for the system. So uh, I just think we need uh, to try to take a longer-term, um, uh, more disciplined perspective on some of these. Again, uh, we talked about it at, at the um, uh, conference last week. Uh, treat this as an investment decision, not as an expense reduction uh, decision, and I think we're going to be uh, better served at the end of the day. Okay, so Louise, um, there's a patchwork of approaches across Canada towards the treatment of certain illnesses. Mental health is a great example of that. Should provinces harmonize treatment methods based on each condition, including a common approach towards pharmaceutical usage for those conditions? No. They shouldn't. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back to this issue of benefit, because really this is a bit about benefit. So the, the federal minister seems to think that if we already have something that's a benefit, then we shouldn't bring in any more stuff. Um, I would have thought a doctor would understand that there's a big difference between benefit on a population health basis and benefit for individual needs. And those two are not the same. So maybe she was talking, you know, to give her the benefit of the doubt, maybe she was talking about population health benefit. But is that really what we, what we want in Canada? Is just, you know, population health? What about individual needs? And I thought innovation was all about individual needs. And the worry I have is that the, the policies are going in this direction, and the science is taking us in exactly the opposite. All the science is moving to precision medicine, targeted therapies, immuno-oncology, genetic-based medicine, and I can go on and on and on. And that's not about population health anymore. That turns almost everything into a rare disease. So I, I really think that this is the crux of the problem. What is it that we really want our public system to do? If we don't want it to help individuals, well, tell us. And then, of course, we'll try and get some private health insurance, which won't help us either, apparently, anymore. So I don't know what we're going to do. But the reality is, you know, everybody's got to get honest and get real. And until we do that, and I agree with you, like the politicians don't have the guts to tell us the truth. And I kind of don't blame them because they're going to get fired from their job if they do. So who's going who's gonna to call the meeting? That's always my question. Who's going to call the meeting to bring us all together in a room to have that honest conversation? So far, I think the patient organizations are the only ones who are prepared to do that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should get everyone together. Let's do it. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Glenn, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, how do you think drug policy factors into reducing the strain of, of these high-need complex patients on the healthcare system? Should we move towards a model where healthcare professionals are rewarded for improved patient outcomes? Um, how could drugs be involved in that? What does that look like? Sure. Um, so um, in most high-performing systems, um, the, uh, the reward is, is actually secondary to generally how the system is organized to compensate the providers generally, how they work in a team environment, how you get the right professional involved at the right time. Right now in the Canadian system, it, most things trigger from the physician usually a family physician, who may see six, seven, eight patients an hour, may see everything from TB to an inoculation to a runny nose in that same time period, and we're dependent on that individual, God bless them, to coordinate care. 
and that's just not happening, okay? So how you organize care really matters in this space, and jurisdictions like Ontario and Alberta and Quebec and others have all tried to reorganize it. But, but it's, more than, it's more than that. You have to actually set the systems up. So you have to have the right professionals in the right place. We also have to recognize you have to do it in an environment that's not kind of gravitating towards large institutions. So uh, to what Louise said in the, in the Canada Health Act, it's physicians and not just hospitals, inpatient hospital services. Those are the insured services that the, uh, everybody kind of connects through the Canada Health Act. And I will remind people, the Canada Health Act isn't a charter of health rights. It's merely a funding piece of legislation that gives the federal government the authority to transfer funds to provinces to run a health system. So that's all it is, but we've enshrined it, like we've enshrined what's in healthcare, et cetera. So in the middle of that, we have several hundred thousand health professionals and assistance to health professionals trying the best they can to provide the care to 36 million Canadians and to our ability to kind of target those who are falling through the cracks. And many of the 565s are those who are falling through the cracks. We have addictions. We have mental health issues. We've got um, uh, chronic disease. We've got um, marital breakups. We have all kinds of things. And, and the whole social determinants infrastructure doesn't even connect to this. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, I'll use Alberta as an example, in some jurisdictions, privacy legislation doesn't even allow the information about the patient to flow to all those who are giving the care. So there are many systemic things that we need to fix. So then we come to drugs, okay? Drugs represent uh, innovative drugs. Drugs in total, about 13% of all health expenditures in Canada. Innovative drugs, about 6.4%, and that's down from about 8.4% uh, 10 years ago. But the focus now is on something very different. And so we're getting these more targeted therapies that Louise is talking about. It's very easy to talk about um, the million dollar patient or the $500,000 patient, et cetera. And therefore we translate that to drug pricings out of control, et cetera. Except there might be 10 people in Canada who have that condition, who may even qualify to that. But we're struggling and it's a nice sound bite. As a young economist, I remember someone in my economics class showing me a, a banner in a national headline, 28 million million eggs went to waste in Canada. What they didn't say until you're about the fourth column in, it was 2% of Canadian production for one year. And I think we have a lot of those lovely catch grab things. So when you're trying to organize the system, this is a fundamental piece. I will argue that ph pharmaceuticals and other new technologies are able to allow for a more cost effective system to be run, less institutional care. The recent uh, um, debate going back and forth on the new hospital in Ottawa for it is a classic example of this. Everybody's looking for the new shrine for healthcare, when in fact, the real investment, not to say they don't need a new replacement facility, but the real investment is, how do we prevent people from going in there to begin with? And that's where pharmaceuticals and other care matter in the system. We're ill-equipped for the task. Last question from me, and hopefully we get a few questions from the floor in. Um, Patty, um, at the end of this conversation, what do you see as the biggest barriers to system change? Is it the inability to move money between silos in the system, like hospital care, primary care, community care, and drug budgets? Or is it the inability to truly account for future savings by providing that better care up front? How do we resolve these issues? Okay. <laughs> Good question. Um, well, I'm a boomer, so first of all, people like me should be told that we should stop being selfish, we should not live forever. Um, and nor do we need all of the, you know, the changes to circle around us. So, you know, that, that's the first barrier, I think, is right now a whole issue of culture. But I want to go back to what um, Glenn said. We really need to stop looking at health as a silo or pieces of health as a silo. And one of the advantages right now is the whole push and speed of innovation and transformation and economic development because Canada has to find new industry and we have to, we have to move to that kind of an economy. Um, because when you talk about a health budget, that's the barrier. A health budget is all of these things are add-ons, add-ons, add-ons. And there has been a false, um, there has been a failure of delivery that in fact all of the things in the past that that the system administrators were told would save money, actually never saved money in enough to be able to move the dollars from one pile to the other. 
Um, so the barrier is the silos of budget, whether it's within a health, even within a hospital, moving money from the fourth floor to the sixth or the ER up to uh, intensive, you know, it was like taking your life in your hands. Um, so, so really, the, the whole rethinking has to be stop trying to add on and do the money with the mix. Because at the end of the day, healthcare is about money. And then we get into the patient, right? Now, one of the you know, big things would be that instead of the other departments or the other funders crying about health eating their lunch and taking all of the money, that should just be a given. That health for a while will be a big cost center. But the advantages are not in healthcare. The advantages are too, and the champions have to come from the other industry. I think, you know, if Ontario is successful with their um, innovation strategy and increased economy, that's a great example of changing the paradigm, right? Because we're still trying to do health and make the savings in health, and we never delivered. And to Glenn's point earlier, um, you can't even talk about that in isolation. That 5%, a good piece of that, is back to the, the um, uh, public issues around health care, the, the health uh, determinants. And we aren't even coming close to addressing those. And in some areas of this country, it's, I'm thinking of indigenous areas, it's, it's terrible. So how can we expect to fix this if we haven't fixed that? A, a new paradigm shift is required, a new way of budgeting and thinking about budgets, and let health be a cost center. Just accept that it will be. But the change will come from those other budgets that are gonna actually bring the stimulus. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, we've got about five minutes. Uh, so if you just wanna to go to the microphone, I think that's the way to go. Great, thanks, thanks very much. That's a great panel and I've really enjoyed everyone's comments. Uh, uh, my name is Wayne Critchley and I, I should explain to preface my, my question or comment that I, I have a background in this field, I guess for about 30 years, including many years heading up the uh, PMPRB, the Drug Pricing Board, a period of time at Cadeth and following these events uh, carefully. And I, 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 what I love about a conversation like this is it could have happened 30 years ago when I started. Uh, when I joined PMPRB, I was told drug costs are out of control. The system is not sustainable. We cannot afford the new th treatments that are coming to market. At that time, people were dying of AIDS, as Louise mentioned. Uh, and, and dying early from cancer, uh, and many other diseases that today are treated, are curable, in some cases are certainly preventable with good lifestyle choices and treatment. And, and I think, wow, so what has happened? Well, I guess we're spending a lot more money on drugs today than we used to. Guess what? We're not. It's still about 16% of total healthcare expenditures. That has been unchanged for about 20 years. Our pricing, in line with the major developed countries that we compare ourselves to, that hasn't changed in 20 years. So when I look at the concern that's going on with the minister's statement, some of the provincial minister's statements, and PMPRB doing a major consultation, getting everybody excited, we gotta change the guidelines and lower prices, yada, yada. Well, we have to be careful we don't stifle innovation in the process and, and, and deny us ourselves access to these new therapies have faith in ourselves as a society and as a system. We can manage, we'll find ways. We've done it. And, and I, I think Luis hit the nail on the head talking about the future. We are moving into a total new world. Our current systems aren't gonna deal with the current new that new world. We have to learn to adapt. But let's not adapt by saying no, <laughs> let's adapt by taking it on and finding ways to do it. Because we've done it before and we can do it again. That's okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, any other comments or questions? We have about three minutes left. Okay, seeing none. I just wanna thank everyone for a really engaging conversation. I think we we're able to cover all sides of a very complex issue and I hope we all learned something today. So thank you for, for your time.